Well, hello and welcome to YouTube. Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video on Math Basic Course. And as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you here today as it is every day here in my virtual classroom. So up on the side as we begin chapter three in the Big Ideas Math Integrated Math 1 textbook. This is on graphing linear functions. Enough of solving linear equations and solving linear inequalities. We're now getting into graphing, folks, starting with section 3.1 on functions way different from what we were doing before but still you know algebra based of course and eventually we're going to get back to some of the solving things with respect to them but for now graphing so there are going to be times where we're going to need graph paper I don't know if this is one of those sections or not just yet we'll talk about it but if we do you have to check to the description section down below and you'll find PDFs of that if you'd like to print it for yourself you can provide your own graph paper make your own graph axes do whatever your teacher mandates of you it doesn't matter what it is but I'll be providing that stuff for you as needed so that way you can follow along with my scales and my axes and things like that if you'd like to just keeping that in mind now this thing on functions is gonna be a very specific type where we're gonna see a lot of different representations of things tables equations graphs things called mapping diagrams you might not have seen that before eventually we're gonna dive in something called function notation but brand new definitions to behold maybe things that you've heard before which is totally fine I hope you've plotted points on a graph before X comma Y things like that I'm probably not going to spend a long time on that if this thing thinks it's not gonna spend a long time on it I don't know what you would learn what you would have learned beforehand for some reason, I feel like you would have done that in like third grade, fourth grade, at least moving on forward. So hopefully everything looks good here. But like I said, kind of way off the beaten path of before, if the stuff that you didn't learn or understand before didn't click just yet, I think you're kind of in the right space for this. This is kind of a new kind of set of material for better or worse new stuff so without further ado i'm gonna go ahead and get started check the description section down below to find the pdf for this specific section if graph paper is needed you also see that as well and then the problem set will be with timestamps down below i'm gonna start with the lecture portion i'm gonna go ahead and get started we are going to determine whether things called relations are functions now those are two different words right here that are part of your core vocabulary they're going to be defining that right here really quickly for you whether or not they're functions and that's pro that's probably a lot of the goal of this today is something a function or not Find the domain and range of functions. Those are two other words right here. Domain and range, it's one of those things, man. People have trouble with it. I don't know why. It's not, it's not very difficult. So I hope we have, I hope I can explain it well. And identify the independent and dependent variables of functions. So you can see all those things are target words, core vocabulary of new stuff here. It sounds like ordered pair is a previous phrasing that you would have heard before. So when we see this x, y, for example, hopefully we know what it represents, what we can do with it on a graph. And mapping diagram sounds like it's something of old as well. So I probably won't spend a long time on it outside of what I need to talk about it with what's new. Okay, here we go. A relation pairs inputs with outputs. And really, if listen, math textbooks give mathy definitions. They sound a little weird. They sound strange. They work. They totally do. But some people don't understand them. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, a relation is a set of points. They, they can give it to you on a graph. They can give it to you as a list. They can give it to you in a table. This is a relation. This is a relation. This is a relation. This is a relation. Is there a graph anywhere? No. Anyway, those are relations right there. Any of those are relations. It's kind of like this is a car. This is a car. This is a car. This is a car. But which of them are convertibles, right? Or but which of them are trucks? But those are all relations. When a relation is given as ordered pairs, the x coordinates are inputs. Boom. I got an input here, input here, input here. And the y coordinates are outputs. So boom, I got outputs right there <laughs> as, as a look. They're, these are probably parts of the uh, questions they're going to ask. A relation that pairs each input with exactly one output is a function. Now that, again, it's a weird mathy definition, and there are different ways I can explain it, but it covers all bases for us because there are different things that people are going to state based on the representation. I will too, but this one covers all of it. A relation that pairs each input with exactly one output is a function. Let's go back to the car example I was talking about, right? All, not all cars are convertibles, but all convertibles are cars, right? Now, what makes it a convertible? It's a car with a, you know, with a pull down top. A function is a relation that, right? All functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. A function is a relation <clears throat> that for every X value, there's only one Y value. Now, what this means for us here, in example one, determining whether relations are functions, in an ordered pair list or in a table, we're going to look at our x values. In this case, I got negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now, did you hear a repeat in any of those x values? I did not. In fact, they went in order, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. They're, so they're asking you, is there more than one y value? 
for a same x value do you see a repeat in x values where you can see different y values when i have a one comma zero do i also have a one comma five for example and the answer is no there's no repeats in x's to yield different y values so each input only has exactly one output is this a function yes every input has exactly one output so it's a function part b you see four eight six four five now i heard a repeat on the number four i saw it right here and right here those are repeats for x for x do they give me different y values four comma zero four comma three they do now that is indicative of something that's not a function this is a relation but it's not a function four comma zero four comma three different outputs for the same input x repeated with different y's the input four is two different outputs zero and three so it's not a function sorry if the under the underlining doesn't really mean very much i'm just kind of highlighting where i'm pointing my mouse at now part c is in order listen i don't know how much we're going to change things from ordered pairs to tables and things like that but this x has this y that means there's a point on this that's negative two comma three and this x has this y so there's also negative one comma four i'm not asking for you to write this as an ordered pair i'm giving you the how this is re-represented in this form and vice versa so that's what you're looking at so here are the x's now i see a repeat on zero just because it repeats, does that mean it's going to be not a function? Not necessarily. You have to see that for this input, you have different outputs. You put in zero, you get five. You put in zero, you get six. Okay, that's an example of not a function. So same input, zero, different outputs, five and six. Part C is not a function for that reason. Now, part D, we have what's called a mapping diagram. Now, this is going to be a little bit different as far as representation. I'm going to give you the ordered pair equivalent of this so you can understand it. Because we have, they haven't spoken on domain and range yet, and these have to do with domain and range. But input, the uh, values here represent your domain. It's not just input, it's your domain elements. Because domain elements do two specific things. They are written in increasing order. It's negative 1 to 3 to 11, that's increasing order. 4 to 15, increasing order. And they don't repeat themselves in domain and range. So these are the domain elements, these are the range elements. Now, negative 1 points to 4, input x, output y. That means there's a point that's negative 1, 4. And then there's a point here that's 3, 15, has 3 points to 15, and 11 also points to 15. Now, uh, those are the three points. That's it. I expected more for some reason. So those are the three. These are the x's. These are the y's. Are there repeats on x? No? Well, then there aren't going to be two different y's for the same x. You might say, Mr. Robinson, there is a repeat on y. Did we have a repeat on y beforehand? Actually, by the way, we did. We had 2 and 2 and 2 and 0 and 0. I didn't even notice that. So it's a good time to mention here. You can have the same output for different inputs. And I'm going to give some analogies for this. But you can have the same output for, for, output for different inputs. You can't have the same input with different outputs. Okay. Repeat on Y with different Xs? Sure. Totally okay. Repeat on Xs different Ys? No. Did this have that? No. It doesn't. So is it a function? It is. This is a function. Let's see what they say. Each Every input has exactly one, power, one output. It's a function. They don't even mention the other version of it. I will verbally sometimes. But yeah, it's the idea, guys. You can repeat Ys and have different Xs. And remember, we come from input to output as well. So anyway, what you're going to see in a mapping diagram really is this, because we don't want to have to write this each time. So I want to bring this up. How did 15 repeat here, but it didn't repeat here? Well, like I said, like I said, it won't repeat here. But what in the mapping diagram will let you indicate there will be a repeat? In this case, multiple arrows pointing to the same number. If I had an extra number here that was 19 and it also pointed to the 15, guess what? 15 would repeat three times. It would be 19 comma 15 as well. So where in a mapping diagram can you see something's not a function without writing out its ordered pair? Well, let's say we had this. Let's say I had an extra number here that was 20 and the three also pointed to the 20. That would mean there would be another point on this thing that would be three comma 20. Suddenly there's a repeat on X. Suddenly it's not a function. Right? And we're going to see examples of this, surely. If not in the problem set, we're going to see examples of this. So how does 3 repeat here? And you see it here? You see a split in your arrows. From an input goes to different outputs. That's what we'll see to make it be not a function in a mapping diagram. Because you won't see the repeat on X. And that's why I keep saying, you know, we don't use a definition. It's not a function if X repeats. Well, there are several things wrong with that. First of all, it's not going to repeat here. It's not going to... Um, you know, on a graph, you don't see numbers repeat themselves. You just see points. And thirdly, a number can repeat, 
but then if it gets the same y value back out it doesn't matter for example on part a what if i have another point here that's zero comma two you notice here that there are two zeros here oh it repeats it's not a function no that's not true they have the same y value zero comma two zero comma two this input of zero still has the same output of two therefore it's still a function so the definition of is something a function or not is written right here and it's a good definition it's a strange one to you perhaps and we're giving the representations and how it is but you can't just say x repeats not a function that you're, you're missing a lot of what's going on there first of all for this representation graphing representation also you need different y's for this set so each input can only have exactly one output is the idea okay so we saw three representations here ordered pairs tables and mapping diagrams let's see this is monitoring progress I'll move forward on that let's look at graphs now let's go with what's called the vertical line test now we're not doing graph graphs they're gonna give us graphs and talk about this is a relation it's a set of points right and this is a relation by well uh, as well I know we haven't been doing a lot of things on drawing curves and lines yet outside of number lines but if you remember when I did number lines the first time I stated a number line you, excuse me inequalities on number lines when we draw arrows it's just a bunch of points that are connected together so what's a curve it's just a bunch of points that are connected together point 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 in infinite set so we draw a curve to connect them what does that mean this is a relation because it's a set of points this is a set of points this is a set of points which are functions though is this relation a function apparently is this one apparently not how come the vertical line test can help us the vertical line test says if you can draw a vertical line through any one point it must only exactly pass through that one point if it passes through more than one point along the way it's not a function so if I drew vertical lines here I'm passing the vertical line test every single time now only takes failing once to not be a function therefore if there was another point that was right here this would fail the vertical line test and it would not be a function now why is the vertical line test a good test here because if there was an additional point here that would mean that this X value let's say it was five this X value would have this Y value here of two and this Y value here of seven that would mean there would be points that are 5 comma 2 and 5 comma 7. Is our goal to write ordered pairs for every other representation we have? Absolutely not. This is the tie-in for it to remind you that this X has different Y's. That's what would fail the vertical line test. And that's why the vertical line test is there. Do you literally need to draw vertical lines on things? No. Uh, does it make sense to draw them to support your claim when something's not a function? Totally. So let's look at the second one. Why is this not a function? Because when I draw a vertical line at some given point that would cross through right here, it also happens to cross through a point right here. Again, this could be a 5 comma 3 and 5 comma 5, you know, something like that. But it fails the vertical line test there. Mr. Robinson, it also fails the vertical line test right here. Yes, it does. And right here. Yes, it does. Now, where does this actually pass the vertical line test? It actually passes right here. If I draw a vertical line, it touches just that one point where there's no repeat on Y for that X however it only needs to fail once and here it fails for the rest of this graph the rest of the way this parabola by the way arrows means this goes on forever in this direction it'll keep going and keep going probably not exactly like that but it'll keep going in those directions forever therefore it's going to always fail the vertical line test it just needs to fail once and it failed here so this relation is a function this relation is not a function let's do the normally I don't do the oh never mind they, these are examples I was going to say for monitoring progress normally I don't do them but they gave us some here so does this pass the vertical line test no it fails here it only needs to fail once but it fails here and it also fails here this relation is not a function because it has two comma two and two comma five repeats of two with different outputs five comma one and five comma five repeats of y with different input excuse me same input different outputs does this pass the vertical line test totally just like that no matter where I draw a vertical line and I have the computer technology to do this whole like and I'm gonna do this for something later I can draw a vertical line and scan this thing right I'll do this for the previous question too if I scan this you know does it set off the detector of beep does it set off the detector so we can try that here let's do the detector thing so so I'm gonna do a little beep for passing beep, beep. oh no like that right sorry for your headphones beep. right it's failing there it's failing there it passes it passes but it just needs to fail once not a function yes a function now we haven't talked about what kinds of relations these are I don't know if we're gonna get into it the ones that are disconnected points are called dis discrete relations and these are called continuous relations I'm sure we'll get into them later but these are both relations they're just different types 
yes a function see see if you can understand why i'm not going to i'm not going to talk about them yes a function yes a function not a function yes a function pass the vertical line test okay it's going to be one of the longer lectures probably given what we're talking about finding the domain and range of a function okay the domain of a function is the set of all possible input values. When you hear input, you think X. Therefore, domain is X, sort of. Right? That's how we talk about it. The range of a function is the set of all possible output values. You're thinking of Y right there. Now, when they say the set of all possible, that means that when it's in that element, when it's in that list, excuse me, when the element is in that list, you only need to write it once. So we're obviously going to do examples. But, you know, if X equals 2 shows up once, you only need to write it once. You don't need to say it's two here. Oh, and it's two here and it's two here. You probably heard me when I talked about the mapping diagram. You write everything in increasing order, which is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I think they will as well. And you never repeat values. If it's in the domain, it's in the domain, right? Anyway, range, same kind of thing. Um, so here's what we would call a function machine, a function machine. I stick negative two into this function machine. The function machine does the following thing. It takes your negative two and it multiplies it by three and it spits something out. Negative two goes in, negative six comes out because that's three times negative two. That's what this function machine does. That's a fun function machine, right? So it's a substitution, three times negative two, da, da, da. Um, we don't have to draw function machines, but that's the idea of it. Anyway, I don't know what this had to do yet with domain and range quite, but negative two is a part of your domain and negative six is a part of your range. Okay, finding the domain and range from a graph. So it's good that we did inequalities in the previous chapter because we're going to talk about inequalities for continuous relations. So this discrete relation says, you know, find the domain and range on part A. This discrete relation has specific points, four of them. It's a finite amount and they're separated. So we can write exactly what they are. This hits an X value of negative. Well, actually here, let's, let's write the order pairs. They have them. But this hits an X value of negative three and a Y value of negative two. So there's an input of negative three and output of negative two. Then there's negative one comma zero here, one comma two here, and three comma four, it's right there. Here are the elements in your domain, negative three, negative one, one, and three. They never repeated, but those are the elements in the domain. And that is your domain right there. It's all of the X values that exist in your relation. So here, I can also write it like this. This is how you're gonna see me write it. Curly braces, D is negative three, negative one, one, and three. One thing I also like about this, although it just happened to be when we went left to right, which makes sense, I went from increase, uh, I, I went in increasing order. I went in increasing order. Now there's negative two, there's zero, there's two, and there's four for the range. How come? Because those were the Y values, negative two, zero, two, and four. So when you see me write my ranges, I'm going to do it like that. There's domain and range unless it's a word problem and then we have to explain more about those lists. So discrete relations, again, I don't think they're really saying that phrasing yet, but the ones where the points are separated, we write as a list of numbers. Now, part B is a continuous, it's not continual, it doesn't go on forever, but it's a continuous relation and it's a function. It's a continuous relation, but that means that there's an infinite number of values, right? It doesn't just hit here. It doesn't just hit here. It doesn't just hit at these parts. It hits everywhere. It hits here, 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 here. We can't write an infinite list. We can instead describe the domain as all of the X values that are hit between this X value and this X value right here. I want you to think of that left and right scanning thing again that we were talking about. What elements exist in this domain when the sensor goes off? are when we hit values for X, right? So where does it start? As far left as negative two, as far right as three, I'm only looking at X. I don't care how far up and down it goes. I care, do I have points from left and right on X? Does it hit X equals 0 0.5? Yes, it hits it right here. Does it hit X equal negative one? Yes, it does right here. X equal four? No, it doesn't hit it. X equal 2.001? Yes, right there. It hits all of those X values between negative two and three. And we can't write that as a list. We don't say negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two because it hits the decimals as well. So what do we do? We write a compound inequality. And we've seen these. The domain for this set from negative two to three is represented right here. X is every number between negative two and three inclusive. There it is. Now the range is the scanning up and down this thing from the bottom to the top. What's the lowest Y value that we hit right there at negative one? And it hits as high up as two right there. So we hit every Y value from negative one and two, negative one all the way up to two. 
So we write that also as a compound inequality, like so. And that's and that's perfect. That's exactly how I'd write it. I would obviously put D and R maybe when I write them, but those are the domains and ranges of those values. And it's a perfect example. Now, there are other ones that we can obviously talk about, and we're going to get to them in the problem set. All right, identifying independent and dependent variables. The variable that represents the input values, x, and it doesn't always literally, excuse me, have to be x, but when you think input, you think x. That's the independent variable because it can be any value in the domain. That kind of means to you that you can, you can choose to substitute values for x. When you hear the word independent, you're thinking of, I have free will. I can be whatever I want for this situation, and I'm going to make things happen to my output. I can't have an output without an input, that kind of thing. The variable that represents the output is the dependent variable because it depends on the value of the independent variable, right? Whatever I get for y, because we're not solving for x and y, you know, we're not solving for variables here. Maybe y is by itself, in which case it's solved for, but y can be any number based on whatever, x, maybe not literally any number, but y is some different number depending on what x is. When x is 1, y is going to be a different number than when x is negative 4. So in this equation, y equals negative x plus 10, y is the dependent variable because it depends on the independent variable x because this is the input where we do things to it. And then out comes this thing right here. Think of the function machine. Identi identifying independent and dependent variables example. The function y equals negative 3x plus 12 represents the amount y in fluid ounces of juice remaining in a bottle after you take x gulps. So identify the independent and dependent variables. Because x is the number of gulps that you take, that input determines then, therefore, how much juice will remain left. It's kind of a cause and effect thing. Not always, but for the most part. And you can sometimes argue the other way. Oh, I have this much juice left. How many gulps did I take? But it's more like I took the gulps, now determine. So x is the independent variable, the number of gulps. And y depends on that, how much juice remains. So therefore, y is the dependent variable, amount of juice. Y is the dependent, x is the independent. Like I said, that's most often the case depending on how they write the question. Maybe they change the variables up. Maybe for some reason x is the dependent. Depends. Part B says the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. What is the range? Now, they're saying that this is a discrete relation. There is no, there's nothing between 0 and 1. It's just literally either you didn't take a gulp or you did, or you took a second gulp or you stayed on the first or the third and fourth gulps. Depending on the number of gulps, we're going to know how much juice is left in here in fluid ounces each time. So, when we substitute 0 into here versus 1, 2, 3, and 4, negative 3 times 0 plus 12, etc., we're getting different output values. These are your inputs, number of gulps. These are, are your outputs, number of fluid ounces. The range, and I, and I don't like the way that they wrote it. I'm going to write it the other way here. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. You know what? Maybe I can say they're wrong, but I don't want to call them out and have them write a dissertation and uh, appeal and state, no, this is why we're right. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it in this order here like so okay increasing order now does that now therefore pair with my domain exactly unfortunately not but guys that's what mapping diagrams are for mapping diagrams are exactly for that so let me show this because i don't think they're going to have one in a second this is our domain this is our range like i said mapping diagrams are made of domains and ranges not just x and y's why the main thing is they don't repeat themselves but also, I like to write an in increasing order. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 0, 3, 6, 9, 12. Which element in the domain zero gulps re, um, mapped with which element in the range number of fluid ounces left? 0 went with 12. And then 1 went with 9, and 2 went with 6, 3 went with 3, and 4 went with 0. So our mapping diagram would actually look like this. Remember, that's what mapping diagrams are for point elements in the domain to elements in the range. They'll be written in increasing order for me otherwise. And by the way, once again, I don't see another, this is probably the end of the examples because they finished their checklist of what they wanted to do. We haven't yet seen a domain and range of a discrete relation where there's a repeat in values, except for what I showed before. But if there was for some reason a gulp, you took a fifth dry gulp and there were still zero ounces left, then I would not repeat the zero on the range, but I would insert the five over there, just so you're aware. Okay. So that's all covered. Uh, if there's only one other thing I wanted to state here, it's that you notice that they're losing three fluid ounces every gulp. I don't know if that's really a part of what we're going to talk about yet, but eventually we'll get to stuff like that. Okay, that's the end of the lecture portion. Again, probably one of the longer ones out there because a lot of new terms, a lot of new visuals. We're not solving things really anymore, right? 
Uh, so let's first answer the vocabulary and core concept check. And then we have to do up to, which I have to actually fix it here. I Give me give me one second. After, you know, we're going to start this in a bit. But we have to go up to number, I'm going to find this out right now, number 43. So let me pause and fix my little uh, thingy here where it says what it's going to be. Hold on. Okay, I got it fixed. Um, all right, here we go. Number one, writing, how are independent variables and dependent variables different? Independent variables are any part of the domain. Well, independent variables, <laughs> dependent variables depend on the independent variables. For one thing, independent variables are a part of the input, whereas dependent are output. Now, I don't know if they said this perfectly. I They said you, I forget how they said it. They said something like you can choose whatever you want for independent, sort of. You won't always get an output though. Uh, independent variables are free to be any input value. Now, the thing about that is sometimes, and we're not going to run into them in IM1, that's why I'm bringing that up, is that you're not going to see restrictions on your domain so much, or your inputs. Um, but you will see restrictions on range. So sometimes you can plug in anything for X, but you might not get every number in the world for Y is basically how we're saying that. Again, it's one of those things, I don't know if it's a perfect answer, but I'm gonna live with it. Number two, different words, same question. Which is different, find both answers. So they say find the range of the function represented by the table. This range, and I'm gonna write that in order, this range is, I'm gonna start with neg the Y's, negative one, then five, then seven. So that's so A. Find the inputs of the function represented by the table. That's different from A. Inputs are your X's. So inputs are negative 1, 0, and 1. It says find the X values of the function represented by this set. That's negative 1, 0, and 1 here. So that's also your B. Looks like that's going to be, look like this is going to be the different one. And find the domain of the function represented by these ones here. That'll be the domain is negative 1, 0, and 1. Oh, I'm sorry. This should be a negative 1 there negative one, zero, and one. So the one that was different was the first one on range. These are also your Y's or your outputs. And that should also be a curly brace. My apologies there. But yeah, whenever I write domains and ranges, I will be writing them as a list represented in curly braces. That's our set. I'll write them in increasing order with no duplicates. And they'll do the same at least with the no duplicates part. So guys, we have numbers three to 43 to do on 3.1 on functions. Doesn't look like we're really drawing our own graphs. I mean, if you need to copy down the graph that you have for the mapping diagram, you can. I'm going to copy and paste it from the textbook itself. But it seems like we're not actually graphing ourselves just yet. But we have representations given them. So again, if there's a diagram that I need to bring over, I will. Otherwise, I'll leave it on its side. I hope you don't mind. In exercises three through eight, determine whether the relation is a function. Explain. I'm going to use what they have over here and represent it. I am looking for, I've, I mentioned this, I am looking for in this table, and you need to listen to the lecture portion if you want to hear more as to why. I'm looking at the X's. I'm really seeing if there are any repeats. If there are repeats, then it, then, excuse me, if there are no repeats, then it is a function. If there are repeats, there's potential for it to be not a function. If there are no repeats. One, two, three, four, and five, this is a function. Every X, every input has exactly one output. That's every X has exactly one Y, okay? Number four, we look at those X's again. We look at the X's and I see seven, five, three, one, and three. This time with those threes, that's setting off a little alarm here. It might not be a function, it depends. Do I have different Y values for that same X value? Three comma negative eight, three comma six. I do, different Y values. That's something that a function can't have, two, inputs, two outputs for the same input. So this one's not a function, not a function. Two, uh, um, the input of three, the input of three has two outputs of negative eight and six. Number five. Now, number five is a mapping diagram. And a mapping diagram has your list of inputs and outputs as ordered pairs, specifically whatever the arrow is pointing to. That means there would be a point on your graph that's 0, comma, negative 3, or 2, comma, 2, or 2, comma, 3 as well. And this is what we really want to feature right here. 
there is a split in this arrow decision from this input to that output and the same input to a totally different output. Now, I don't like that the range is written out of order. However, it still goes to show that two would technically repeat itself here because there's a two comma three and two comma two. This as well is not a function for the same kind of reason right here. I'm gonna do as much copy and pasting as I can. The input of two has two outputs of two and three. I cannot believe they write that out of order. So because of that, not a function. Now I'm gonna prep this one here for number six. Number six, we have another mapping diagram. However, this time we have five different inputs right here and they never repeat themselves because they never go to different outputs. Even though two inputs go to the same output, these three inputs go to the same output, that's okay, that's allowed. <clears throat> you can totally do that. So is this a function? Yes. If you wrote these out as ordered pairs, X would never repeat itself. Every input has exactly one output. So there we go. All right, numbers seven and eight are tables, which can be thought of like ordered pairs, less like mapping diagrams, more like ordered pairs because you're tying exactly input to output, input to output. So you're trying to ask yourself, well, did X ever repeat and have different Y values? Here's a repeat on X of one. Here's a repeat of X on 16. As 16's repeat, we have different Y values of negative two and two. As these repeat right here, you have different Y values of negative one and one. Remember, just like the vertical line test for graphs, it only needs to fail once for it to matter, for, for it to not be a function. So I wonder if I'm supposed to describe both, but in either case, it makes it not a function. Not a function, the input of, of one has, di has two inputs of negative one and one. And then the input of 16, the, the input of 16 has two outputs of negative two and two. Do you have to list both? I don't know, probably not, but it says explain and I explained. Number eight, the X's never repeat themselves, which is a good way in a table of stating that you're not gonna have the same uh, different outputs for the same input. So this one, totally a function for number eight. Okay, so that's function versus not a function. Now I wanna remind you that all of these are relations. Everything that you're gonna look at here is a relation. Why this told, by the way, there's a kind of problem that I didn't mention here. I mentioned the representations. We'll have ordered pair lists, mapping diagrams, tables, graphs, equations. We can also have word problems. There are six different representations that we're probably gonna see on, see on here. And any one of them can help you describe whether something's a function or not. Now numbers nine through 12 says determine whether it represents a function explain. This is where we wanna to go to the vertical line test because it can help tell us if, there, if it ever fails the vertical line test, then we're getting two y's or more than one y for the same x. This x value here has one y, this has one y, one y, one y, one y. This passes the vertical line test. So for number nine, it's a function. If I state passes the vertical line test, then I'm, I'm stating a lot about that. I'm, I'm implying within that what the vertical line test represents and what it means to do so. Now on number 10, we actually fail the vertical line test. We fail it three times. We fail it here. We have, let me thin this out a little bit. We have two Y values for the same X value here and here and here. Just like this, it only needs to fail once. I have zero comma two, zero comma four. Repeat X is different Y's. And same with at two and four. So we fail at three different spots. So 10 is totally not a function. Not a function. There are two inputs for, sorry, there are two outputs for each of the inputs, x equals zero, two, and four. At all of those, we have that amount. Now, you might not know what, you're like, Mr. Robinson, who cares if I have different y's for the same x? You'll care when you have equations. You'll care when you have a situation that when you, um, you know, that you're in two places at once or that you get two different dollar amounts for the same sold item or something like that. You will care in the real world when something like that happens. So yes, every input needs one output. You'll care that when on your calculator, you do 23 times 64 and you get the correct answer and next time you type it in, you get a different answer, right? Or when you push the vending machine for chips, you get soda. Yeah, it'll, uh, instead. you get chips the first time, you get soda the next time. Yeah, being a function versus not, actually matters. So what difference does it make? It makes a world of difference, obviously. Oh, we have two more on this set. Numbers 11 and 12. So number 11 
continuous relations are still relations. They still have a set of points. They can still be functions or not. So on the vertical line test here, we totally pass at x equals one. We have just that one y value there. But afterward, oh man, anywhere, and I just need it once. I just need it once to fail. Let's say at x equals three, it fails there. There's a point there and a point there, two y's for the same x. Now I can be very specific and I could state that it fails for every x value that's greater than one, but I can also just give one specific counterexample to disprove it. It just takes one, not a function. There are two outputs for the input x equals three, among others. You know me, I generally don't like to type explanations. I like to say them out loud, but that can be it. You can say for any input of x that's greater than one, it's going to continue doing that. And remember, just because the window range restricts this thing, the arrow shows will keep going that way and we'll keep going that way, which means it keeps failing in those cases. Now, number 12, it's curvy, but is it passing? Yep. My sensor's not going off as far as failing the vertical line test here anywhere. Every X only has one Y. Now, if there was such thing called a horizontal line test for original functions here, then it would fail that each Y has the same X here and here and here, and it would keep repeating like that. But that's not such the case. We don't care about that. We can have the same input, the same output with different inputs. Sometimes I confuse myself when I say it. Uh, number 12 is a function. Each input has exactly one output. So I'm going to go back and copy and paste that thing. Uh, oh, I stopped saying the vertical line test thing, which is okay. I described it. According to the vertical line test, what happened there? Here it's a function. It passes the vertical line test. The VLT, if you will. <laughs> okay, numbers 13 to 16. Find the domain and relation of the function represented by the graph. Now, what's interesting about this, and will probably be true for future sections, by the way, is because this happens in other wakes of math. They have you test whether something or not is a function, so you start understanding what a function is. After that, they start saying, okay, these are all functions now, and then we're just going to do some different things with it. It's like when you take IM2, you're going to learn what's called a polynomial. You're going to first test whether something's a polynomial or not. After that, guys, everything's a polynomial, and they're going to say, okay, do things with a polynomial. So here it says do things with the function. So that must mean these all pass the vertical line test, and they look to. That wasn't the question. They said find the domain and range. So on numbers 13 through 16, we have exactly that. Specifically numbers 13 and 14, you have discrete relations with specific disjointed points. That means we can write this finite set of values as a list of numbers. Domains are the X values that exist here. And the vertical line thing can still help, not as a test, but as information seeking. This X value here is negative two. That's when X equals negative two. This one X equals negative one and zero and one and two. Just because I have a vertical line drawn doesn't mean I'm not talking about these x values right here. X, 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 x. So my domain are those five x values. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. The inputs of this set. Now this is where a horizontal line would make sense for the range. Now as I stated before, domain and range, you do not repeat values listed. So check out where these first values are hit. That's when y is negative 2. And then when y is 0. And then when y is 2. Now, despite the fact that when we do, um, we write ordered pairs out or we do a table, we would repeat values when we talk about negative two comma negative two and two comma negative two, one comma zero, negative one comma zero, but we're not going to repeat y's in our range. Now I'm going to write an increasing order. The lowest y value I saw was negative two, even though it hit twice, I'm just going to write it once. And then it hit y equals zero. And then it came up to y equals two. It hit nothing in between. Zero may have been repeated twice. Two was not, but we're only going to list them once. Not unless we make a mapping diagram will we draw arrows to these different points. So that is my domain and range for 13. Number 14, I'm going to do less as far as the describing of it. I think you just saw it right there. But my x values seem to be negative 2, 0, 2, and 4. So let's write the domain on those. The y values, or value this time, if you will, there's only y value that's, there's only one y value that's ever hit. And this is a function still, by the way. Negative 2, 3, 0, 3, 2, 3, 4, 3. The only y value in this list is 3, the only element in your range. Don't write it repeated four times. That's it. Okay, number, oh, I didn't move on to that. I'm so sorry there. That happens when I get excited. Okay, numbers 15 and 16 are continuous functions. They're continuous, therefore, we cannot write a list of numbers because they span infinitely. Now, in this case, that doesn't mean it goes to negative and positive infinity. It just means there's an infinite set of numbers. 
Now it goes as far as this uh, vertical line thing goes, when my sensor goes off for points, beep, everywhere from negative four to two on X exists a point on this graph. There's no jump whatsoever. So we can write a compound inequality for this. X hits every value in your domain between negative four and two, including negative four and two. For range, we can do a similar-esque thing and ask yourself, what's the lowest Y value that we ever touch? Boom, right there at Y equals two. That's Y equals two. Now, as we scan up, you're gonna notice this right here. You're gonna go like, oh look, Y also, equals hit, uh, also hits three, right there, boom, you see that? And then it stops hitting Y values. Oh, hold on a second, it hits Y values over here. And it was hitting Y equals three over here, by the way, and it was hitting everything leading up to it. From two upward, it doesn't matter that it stops hitting points there, as long as it hits points. Remember, this is a repeat of Y values here. It hits the same Y value twice, doesn't matter. Range elements we only list once. Does it hit it is all we ask. So it goes as low as two, and how high up does it go? Up to six. After six, it doesn't hit any Y values. As far as my sensor goes, beep. It goes from two to six, that's it. It hits them all though. So our range is going to be lower bound of two on Y, upper bound of six, inclusive, that's our domain range. Now, number 16 is also a continuous function. There is one slight difference of this, though, and I don't know if you saw the endpoints of them. They have these open circle looks. Now, we just graphed inequalities all last chapter, and we saw that closed circles, such as these ones, or even these ones, represent solutions to your set, points that are on your graph, numbers that exist. Open circles, we always saw as things that didn't exist. Therefore, although this goes as far left as two, and as far right as six, uh, seven, excuse me, as far left as 2 and as far right as 7, it doesn't include 2 or 7, not for x. From 2 to 7, okay, but exclusive. So my domain in this set is from 2 to 7 on x, but we don't include 2. We don't include 7. x is between 2 and 7 only, including 2.1, including 6.99999, things like that. The range is the same way because it still has the same open circles, but it obviously has different y values that it hits. The low bound, the floor is one. It doesn't include one, but that's when we start hitting points. And then it goes all the way up to y equals six, and it doesn't include six. So we go from one to six on y for this continuous range, and the same thing, it doesn't equal them. Y is from one to six. So chapter two on inequalities, although we didn't solve them at the time, we still have to know how compound inequalities work, obviously, and there's your set. Number 17 is modeling with mathematics. It says the function y equals 25x plus 500 represents your monthly rent in dollars, y, when you pay x days late. So y equals 25x plus 500. That means for every day late, you know, one, two, three, four, et cetera, that's another $25 added to your overall uh, monthly rent. That probably means that up front, you spend $500 for monthly rent and then if you're late on payment, we add 25 each time. So it says, identify the independent and dependent variables. This might be something that I end up typing more often than not. We'll, we'll find out. I'm going to try it right now. So independent variable and dependent variable. The dependent depends on the independent, right? Independent is the... Um, oh, they just want the variables or the representation. X, X is the independent variable, guys. It's the number of days late. How many days late? Y is the dependent variable. It's amount you pay. Uh, let's see, how do they say it? Monthly rent. So I don't know if they want us to represent it in context or to state which variables are which. It's often X is independent, Y is dependent. That's a good thing. But Y clearly depends on X. Whatever X is, I can now figure out Y. However many days late, I can figure out my rent. Part B says the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. What is the range? So for part B, what we have to do is substitute those values for X. Domain is zero, one, two, three, four, five. You're either a day late or you're not. Maybe by the 23rd hour and 59th minute, if you make that payment, then you're not going to be penalized. Something like that. Anyway, so we're gonna do Y equals 25 times zero plus 500 which is zero plus 500, which is 500. That's how much you would owe after zero days late, right? That's just your monthly rent. One day late is 25 plus 500, which is 525. Two days late 
Now, it's no secret that you'll probably pick up a pattern on what's happening here to the effect that you probably don't need to write as much as I will. In future problems, I probably won't write as much as I will, but we need to get the understanding in two ways of what it means to have substitution, of what it means to have a constant increase in value. All those things apply. So let's do it for this problem at the very least and see what we want to do after that with future problems. We'll still do it for four and five. Four days late. Oh, you should have made your payment. Now you owe six. Whoops, I was just copying what was above. Now you owe 600 bucks in total, 100 extra, an extra 20% on top of what that was. Don't be five days late. No, 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 no. Don't make this a part of your domain. Otherwise, your range is going to go as high as $625. So your range, and remember, this is money. Your range basically, so the domain states how many days you can be late or whatever. Your range states how much money you can end up owing potentially. These are the amounts that you could potentially owe based on those domain values. That's what we're representing here. That's why I like census of word problems. I'm understanding what it is we're actually doing with it now. Okay, so there's the range. That's part B. Okay, number 18, also modeling with mathematics. Same kinds of questions. The function y equals 3.5x plus 2.8 represents the cost y in dollars of a taxi ride of x miles. We spend y amounts based on x miles. You know taxi fare, you jump in the taxi, you say, quick, follow that thing. I, I don't know if taxis are allowed to do that, by the way. Uh, yeah, bring me to 3rd and King Street, whatever. Like that, they start the meter, you're already at $2.80 to start because they're like, hey, you got in my taxi. I'm going to owe you something. Uh, I'm going to charge you something. You cost me another customer if you come right back out, so at least give me the 280. You have me drive five feet, that's a waste of everyone's time. You owe me 280. Anyway, 350 a mile, right? Identify the independent and dependent variables. Again, if we're talking just specifically variables, independent is X, dependent is Y. I'm going into that just for this problem here. It seems like, I think even the example problem they did that, but x also represents number of miles y represents number of dollars so the number of dollars depends on the number of miles you drive i think that makes sense part b you have enough money to travel at most 20 miles in the taxi find the domain and range of the function now this one here is unlike unlike the previous question where you're either a day late or you're not this mileage racks up within the mile you travel half a mile you're paying more then you travel zero miles or you pay less than you're traveling one mile. There's a continuous thing to this one. So this setup, I stated that you don't need to know anything from, from chapters one and two from this. Well, I lied. You would for this kind of question. It says you have enough money to travel at most 20 miles in the taxi. So X can represent for your domain. Listen, you start by traveling zero miles at, at least and you can travel at most 20 miles, no more than 20 miles. So this is our domain. This is our domain for the set. Now the range is based on your domain, right? It depends on it. How much money I spend is based on the minimum amount of miles that I travel, the maximum amount of miles that I travel, because that's probably the min and max of the amount that I spend. So for range, let's look at the bottom end of x equals zero. If x equals zero, y equals 3.5 times zero plus 2.8. That's zero plus 2.8 or 2.8. 2.8 dollars. $2.80, we're going to talk about that in a bit. But $2.8 looks like the low end, I mentioned that, of what you would spend. You can go up to 20 miles, you have, what did they say? You have enough money for this. So how much money do you actually have up to? Let's do 3.5 times 20 plus 2.8. And that's 770. 70 plus 2.8, which is 72.8. Now I want to do this in terms of uh, units here, so our range we will be spending, if we enter that taxi, we're going to be spending as little as $2.80 and as much as $72.80. Now, it can hit anything in between, and that's why I'm not writing this as a list. It's not mile one, mile two, mile three, mile four as a list, because you can do mile 7.18, and then you're spending that much money on it. So you're going to hit every dollar amount leading up to there and cents leading up to there based on this travel amount and that's your domain that's your range so a little different question from number 17 i suppose it's a continuous relation 
Okay, error analysis. In exercises 19 and 20, describe and correct the error in the statement about the relation shown in the table. Number 19, we have this table and they say it's not a function because one output is paired with two inputs. Well, ho, 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 hold on. They are correct that six repeats itself and it has different x values for that. They are incorrect in stating that's not a function. Now, is it a function or not? That depends on this thing. Looks like it is a function because each input never repeats itself. There's only one output for each input. But they said there is two. there are two inputs with the same output. Well, that's allowed. You are allowed to have, I, listen, you're allowed to have it in any relation, but function, based on function definition. In a function, we may have two inputs with the same output. Whereas they said they whereas they said that we couldn't. So let's fix this. This is a function. Not because they're wrong, or like not because they said isn't incorrect. It's because each input has one output. Every input has exactly one output. We're not looking for how many inputs there are for each output. We're at, we're trying to see how many outputs there are for each input. Number 20. The relation is a function. The range is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, once more, well, listen, it is a function. But that's not the range. That's the domain. So maybe, they and listen, they meant well. They talked about the right numbers. They just said the wrong word. It's not range. Now, now at least they got that it's a function. It is indeed a function. And it's based on the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 values. However, those are domain elements and not range elements, which matters because we're not looking for range values to determine whether it's not a function. Again, they looked at the right numbers. They have the right reasoning. They just have the wrong terminology for range. Okay, numbers 21 and 22 identify the independent and dependent variables. So number 21 says the number of quarters you put into a parking meter affects the amount of time you have on the meter. Now they're helping you a little bit as you, you know, there are other words we can use other than depend. They said affects, you can hear causes, you can say is based on, you know, things like that. Uh, operates, you know, allows for, that kind of stuff. So they say the number of quarters you put into a parking meter. I put quarters in the meter, boom, it tells me how much time I'm gonna have. It sounds like the amount of time there is depends on the number of quarters. So if the amount of time depends on the number of quarters, the independent, can I, can I state it that way? The, the amount of time on the parking meter, uh, in, in the, let's see, uh, on the meter, yeah, parking meter, depends on the number of quarters I put into it, or you put it, whatever, into it. Therefore, therefore, quarters independent. Number of quarters independent. De dependent is amount of time. So I don't know if I have to explain it each time like that. I'm going to type that out. And clearly, this is why I don't like doing handwriting. Because <laughs> I wanted to kind of rush at the end of the problem. But uh, hopefully it made sense what we said there. Number 22. The battery power remaining on your MP3 player is based on the amount of time you listen to it. Do you guys know what an MP3 player is? It's, it's, it's half a joke. And at the same time, I don't know how long YouTube lasts for videos, how long this channel lasts. You could be listening to this in the year 2784 and you're like, what's an MP3 player? So I have no idea. If I last that long on YouTube, fantastic. Um, the battery power remaining on your MP3 player is based on the amount of time you listen to it. So they're telling you specifically, actually, you know, there's no reason I had to state this sentence. What I stated was kind of a repeat of what they said, but same thing here. I listen to it more, the battery, right? It goes, or sorry, it goes down that way. So independent, I'm just gonna say independent, dependent. So independent is time listened. And I'll be honest, the majority of the time, no pun intended, time listened. The majority of the time, time is an independent variable. Based on time, you can figure something out. That's not always the case. It's not always the case, but it's generally the case. It's almost the default assumption unless something changes. Uh, dependent variable is battery power. Listen, you don't have to get very technical on it. You don't have to say 
that as this goes up this goes down or anything like that uh on mp3 player maybe get at least that specific hold on i have a knock at my door you just heard the doorbell give me one second here okay i'm back and uh that was your friendly neighborhood spider-man exterminator <laughs> A door-to-door -door guy trying to apply treatment to houses. Maybe I'll look into it. Got his card. We'll see. It's that time of year. All right. Did we finish that one? Yes. Battery power. Time listen. All right. We're all good. Okay. That was 21 and 22. Number 23 says multiple representations. The balance Y in dollars of your savings account is a function of the month X. Now, when we talk about functions, once again, we're stating that based on the month, you can figure out a certain balance. You'll never, on a given month, have different balances. That would be weird. That would sound like it doesn't function. So the fact that it's a function totally works for me. Anyway, these are your inputs. These are your outputs. It says describe this situation in words. I don't know if we need to describe when it comes to like the actual answers themselves um, or if we're supposed to do more with that. So I think we probably need to. Otherwise, they'd say they wouldn't say what they said on top. So on month zero, at the start, at the start, the, what is the savings account? The balance of the savings account begins at $100. And every month, can you guys tell? Every month it goes to $125, $150, etc. It's increasing uh, $25. And every month the balance increases $25. Now this can be because of interest. It can be because of deposits. It can be because I won free money. I don't know what it is, but it increases $25. Now that's part A. Part B says, write the function as a set of ordered pairs. So I've gotten into this a little bit, right? Tables have the X's pairing to those Y's. So we have zeros going to 100, and then 1, 125. 2 is at 150, etc. So we don't do this unless we're required to, and here we're required to. 4, 200. Part C says, plot the ordered pairs in a coordinate plane. Okay, so I guess we do need to graph something here. Um, I'm going to provide, I'm going to provide this graph paper. I have this set for every page, no matter what things I do, because I never know when it's going to pop up. So it's going to look like this, and I can provide this for you as well. You could do this not to scale up to you. The thing is here, these have different specific numbers, and I'm going to have to change them. Because the scale on X's, I can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here just fine. That's okay. The Y's seem to go up a little bit more. So much so, they cap out, cap it off at 200. Now, if I have 10 increments go up to 200, that means every one of them can be 20s. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And that can work out for me there. And that works out perfectly, I think, for me as far as fitting points. This is still the normal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, when X is 0, Y is 100. That can be a point on here. When X is 1, Y is 125. Now these go up by 20s, right? 20, 40, 60, 80. So 125, here's 20, here's 40. A quarter of the way up from 20 to 40 would probably be 125 like that. So it's not perfect. 150 is halfway up, between, halfway between 140 and 160. And that's when X equals 2. When X equals 3, we're at 175. Again, that would be a quarter of the way from 160 to 180 because that's 15 20ths of the way up, or sorry, three, three quarters of the way, that way. And then 200 is at 200 there, and that's when x equals 4. So that's the best I can do for that as far as fitting the points. You could change the scales however you choose to, but that's just to get things kind of in the perfect zone. So if you want my graph paper stuff, I'll provide it. I think it'll make more sense if there are more problems with things I need to graph like that. So I'll provide it, but I wouldn't print out a whole graph paper just for one problem like that. Make up your own scales probably. I get lazy though. Oh, here's the second one. So maybe maybe it's going to be worth it. But number 24, the function 1.5x plus 0.5y equals 12 represents the number of hardcover books X and softcover books Y you can buy at a used book sale. Solve the equation for y. Now, what I was going to state before part a came up is that there isn't really a true independent dependent variable here. They're both on the same side of the equation, neither solve for. It doesn't really sound like that doing one causes the other to happen. But if they force it, they say solve for y, which, by the way, is a very common thing that we would do in situations like these because the y equals form is something that we see quite often. So in terms of solving for y, again, okay, I guess you do need to get a little bit of your um, one, your chapter one on. 
and literal equations were a part of section 1.5. So if you know your 1.5, you know what we would do here. Subtract 1.5, oh, no pun intended. Subtract 1.5x from both sides on these. Now I have 0.5y. So I guess I lied when I stated you don't need to know anything from those. You will, you will, but we're not generally solving for things. This is solving in a different light, right? I guess it's good that we knew that stuff. Anyway, if you saw what I did in section 1.5, I like to front with my X term personally because we're probably gonna be doing it even later in this chapter, if not the next chapter. Now I'm gonna divide both sides by 1.5 or by 0.5 here after to solve for Y. And if you don't know, 0.5 is one half. So when I divide by one half, I'm also multiplying by two, which is just nice when it comes to these final results. Negative 1.5 times two is negative three. So that's negative 3x. 12 times 2 is 24. So this is why, by itself, we get negative 3x plus 24. I Honestly, listen, I shouldn't go slowly on a problem like that. That was chapter 1, two chapters ago. So I just want to make sure that we understand what we got done. Now, what does this represent? x is the number of hardcover books. y is the number of softcover books. Based on the number of hard... Now it's kind of independent, dependent. Based on the number of hardcover books I buy... Y is the number of soft cover books I can buy. When I buy more hardcover books, there are less soft cover books I can buy. Part B, <clears throat> make an input output table to find order pairs for the function. So yeah, now this is, well, I'm gonna make my own, but now this is based on X, I get certain Y. So I can do this as such. I can do an X, Y table, you know, like this. So I got X and Y, and this is a discrete relation. I either buy a hardcover book or I don't. So here's zero. And then we move forward. <clears throat> One, two. And I don't know if you know this, but your domain is limited because you can only buy so many before you can't afford them. Now, how many? I can tell you right now it's going to be eight. Maybe you can tell why it's going to be eight. Negative three times a number plus 24. We can only go until we run out of money. Now, I'm going to do this mentally, if that's okay. Neg when X is zero, negative three times zero is zero plus 24 is 24. Then we have negative three times one plus 24, so 24 minus three. And then we do 24 minus three times two, six. 24 minus nine. And maybe you can tell just what's happening here, it's decreasing by three. That probably makes sense there, decreasing by three. So 24 minus another three, minus another three, etc. Another three, another three, and another three. So it's at that point that, you know, we can't buy nine hard hardcover books because then we're buying negative three softcover books and that, that doesn't really make any sense. It says plot the ordered pairs in a coordinate plane. So this is where we do go back to that set. Now, I don't have any graph paper that is first quadrant based only, which would be nice to have. A lot of word problems don't deal in negatives unless it's like negative money, negative profit. But here, I'm only dealing in the first quadrant my X's are again fine going from zero to eight, but my Y's go up to 24. You don't have to go by equal amounts. I can go by threes. In fact, I should go by threes. These drop by threes. So this makes sense that maybe I make this 30 and therefore this is 15, things like that. And these are going up by threes. So when X is zero, Y is 24. This is 18, 21, 24 right here. When X is one, Y is 21 and this is 18. It kind of looks like a drop like this if you have the scale the way that I have it written. And it shows, and do we connect the dots? No, I didn't connect the dots last time either, and we shouldn't. This is a discrete relation. Connecting the dots means that all these other points, it's a terrible connecting, uh, means that all these other points would exist. It would mean that I could have, I could purchase three and a half hardcover books and therefore I have uh, 13 and a half softcover books. That doesn't work that way. You either have the book or you don't for this specific set, and that would be the order pair set here. Okay, number 25, attending to precision. The graph represents a function. Find the input value corresponding to an output of two. They say the input value, which makes me sound like there's only one of them. They could say value or values. But on number 25, let's just look at the graph over here. Output of two means when y is two. If you scan this, there's only one place that we get an output of two, that's with the input of negative two. So in that case, 
I'm just going to put negative 2. I, I don't really know what else to put. I could say when the output is 2, the input is negative 2. There's a point on the graph that's negative 2 comma 2. But that's the answer on number 25. I was precise. Number 26, open-ended. Fill in the table so that when t is the independent variable, probably a time, the relation is a function, and when t is the dependent variable, the relation is not a function. Okay, interesting. Well, maybe not time. But anyway, I'm going to copy-paste this table over. And to make it be a function when t is the independent, that means that that is the, um, those are the inputs. Those are the inputs. And when it's the dependent variable, it means they're the output. So what I want to do is make it so that t does not repeat itself, but that v does repeat itself somewhere. T, I can say 0, 1, 2, and 3. And V, I just got to do at least one repeat. I can repeat all the time. I can repeat once. I can do 4, negative 2, 4, and 7, like that. As long as two of them repeat for here, then when it's swapped around and V is the independent variable as the inputs, then it's not a function. So here's an example. It's totally open-ended. So remember, the original set, T is the uh, independent, V is the dependent, is there's a point 0, 4, 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 7. No repeats on inputs. So each input has one output. Now we change it. 4, 0, negative 2, 1, 4, 2, 7, 3. 4 is a repeated input with different outputs of 0 and 2. And that's the open-endedness of function versus data function. Number 27, analyzing relationships. You select items in a vending machine vending machine that's my analogy vending machine by pressing one letter and then one number explain why the relation that pairs the letter number combinations with food or drink is a function because each input only has exactly one output every time i press a1 i'm only going to get popcorn a2 i'm only going to get nuts a3 pretzels etc so each input yields only exactly one output so hopefully that's kind of making sense there but each each Sorry, I shouldn't say specifically, just input output. Let's be specific. What do they say? One letter and one number. Each letter number combination, or A, each letter number combination specifically provides, uniquely provides only one food or beverage item. Identify the independent and dependent variables. Independent variable is my choice of input, my button presses, my letter number combination, right? I'll just say independent is button press or presses. Beep, 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 beep. Now, if I press A, D, C, I don't know if I'm going to get any food. It'll probably say error. Try again, you idiot. Uh, dependent. Dependent is the food item. The food item that I receive depends on the button combination that I press, that I push. Part C, find the domain and range of the function. Oh, interesting. So with the domain and range, you have to remember this is a certain combination of the, I, I listen, the tags are below. This is, this is exactly what you can write. Just A1, A2, A3, etc. So the domain is all these values here. And I'm gonna list them kind of in that order. So A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, B4, and C1 to C4. If you press C4, it'll explode. If you press A1, you don't get steak sauce. How about A113? Hmm? A little Pixar? A little Pixar trivia? A little Pixar Easter egg? Range is... Oh, I don't know what all these things are. Let's see. I'm going to type them out. It's not going to be an alphabetized list as much as I uh, stated I'd be doing things like that. I'll have ChatGPT do that for me. But I have... Popcorn... Nuts, pretzels, protein bar. I already had a protein bar today. Granola bar, cereal in a vending machine. Is that an energy bar? Energy bar. Juice. Now juice happens again. Do I list it more than once? No. And it's the same kind of juice, so no. Water. I can't read what that says. Hold on. Milk. Milk. Um... Yeah, hey guys, this is still a function. Wait, did they say what this function? Yes, it's still a function. Just because I have two different button presses that gives me the same item, again, you can have two different inputs give you the same output, just like a vending machine. That's fine, that's allowed. And 
Oh, yeah. So every time I press C1, I should get juice. I shouldn't get something different. But if I press C1 and then I press C2 and I get juice for both, that's fine. Vending machines do that all the time. They're like five different options for water and four for Coca-Cola and then one for, you know, Arizona tea. Like all those kinds of things. That's that's how they work. And that's how functions work. That's just how it is. All right, anyway. Okay. Number 28. And listen, that's that's honestly that's honestly probably the most self-serving problem on this whole set. It makes the most sense out of what functions are versus what they're not before you hit the math stuff, obviously. 28, how do you see it? The graph represents the height h of a projectile after t seconds. Now, this might be your first time seeing a graph thing like this, so I want to let you know. So you might see a projectile go pew, pew, and you're thinking, oh man, look how far that thing went. Okay, this is height. So this is how far it went up and down, right? It went, oh, look how high up, look how high down it went. But guys, it might have gone straight up and down. No, Mr. Robinson, look, it went this way. No, it didn't. This is time. Time. We're seeing time as a physical thing. And this, this will be new for you. That's why I said time is most often going to be an independent variable. Depending on time, something happens. Time is now a physical visual representation for us. And as time goes on, you, you see them on timelines, like in history and stuff like that, in 1800s and in 1840 and all that stuff, right? As time goes on, what's happening? The rise and fall of the projectile. And so this projectile, for all we know, could be going straight up and down. It could be shooting outwards, whatever it is, it, a toy rocket, whatever this thing is. Um, but this is time. I just want to make sure you, you fully get that. Okay. Explain why h is a function of t. Well, if we're talking about, you know, each input as one output, this is a graph. We've mentioned the vertical line test. This thing passes the vertical line test because there's always just one point for every, uh, there's always one point for every t value that we pass through. At one time, the projectile is never at two different heights. Right? That's, that's how I see it. Anyway, I said that out loud. I'm going to write down it passes the vertical line test. which again, explains a lot within there. You might have to do those explanations or at the very least, you have to understand what that means to pass it. Part B, approximate the height of the projectile after 0.5 seconds and after 1.25 seconds. Uh, just, just an approximation, but we look at 0.5 seconds is right here. It's at 20 feet and 1.25 seconds. Here's one, here's 1.25 is right there. So that's gonna be more of an estimation. So at Oh, you don't know function notation yet. So I'm going to say after 0 0.5 seconds, it's approximated to be around 20 feet of height. You probably learn function notation in this chapter, though. So we'll learn it later. At 1.25 seconds, whoops, seconds, these go by fives. I don't know, 28 feet, 29 feet. Let me erase that and see that a little better. It's probably closer to 29, say 29 feet. Do, do, do. All right, part C, approximate the domain of the function. The domain is approximating time t, what t values exist in this thing. Remember, it starts as left, as far left as zero, and as far right as wherever it hits the ground. Maybe that's around 2. Point, let's see, 2.2, 2.5. Oh, I have to be very particular here. If this would be 2.75, maybe that's around 2.6. I'll say 2.6 for that one. But keep the following in mind. This is a continuous interval. So all the way from here to here, time is always tracked. It's not just at second one and second two. And that's what we're explaining. This word problem, the contest helps ex us explain how long was the projectile in the air? That's kind of what's being asked, right? So the domain goes from time zero, including time zero, all the way to time two point, what did I say, six? 2.6, and that's in seconds. Part D is T a function of H explain. Well, we don't often do it the other way, but they're saying is time a function of height? And that's more of a horizontal line test thing this time, right? Is time a function of height? Meaning, can I determine the time based on the height as a single entity? No, no, you can't. This fails a horizontal line test. You get multiple times for certain heights. So horizontal line test fails, no. There are multiple times represented for singular heights. 
which is okay that that's not a function that way. It needs to kind of go the other way, right? The height of the projectile is 15 feet, right? You see the horizontal line right now? The height of the projectile is 15 feet. What time was it at? You can say, you know, point whatever this would be, point, you know, three seconds, and I'd say wrong. I wanted to look at it at 2.2. .2. Wrong. It's not 0.3, it's 2.2. But, but 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 it is yeah but that wasn't the one i was looking for you know what i mean right it's it's not a function if there's more than one answer that's not what we do so the other way that the current way we said height's a function of time yes time's a function of height no all right number 29 making an argument your friend says that a line always represents a function is your friend correct explain now we're talking about a graph okay now, I don't need to have a graph drawn for this scenario. I'm just giving you the heads up on what they're talking about. They mean whatever a line's represented, whether it's continuous and continual or not, I'll pretend like it is, that if I have some sort of thing right here, is this a function? This is a function. It passes the vertical line test, right? So is this. So is this. Heck, so is this. It's very sharp, but I can draw vertical lines through that. Is there any kind of line I can make that fails the vertical line test? A vertical line. A vertical line fails the vertical line test. How about this one? This line right here at x equals negative 5. I can draw a vertical line through that vertical line. That sounds really dumb, but that's that's literally what I'm saying. I can draw a vertical line through that set of points right there. And at this x value, there are multiple y values. It fails the vertical line test at this x value. So your friend says any line, every line except for a vertical line. Almost correct. Nearly there, but no cigar. So a line always represents a function. My friend is incorrect because a vertical line would fail the vertical line test. That sounds weird because you're like, wait, is a vertical line test testing whether something's a vertical line? No, a vertical line test asks when you draw a vertical line, do I only get one Y for that particular X? In this case, you have an infinite number of Y's. It totally fails that one. So it's a weird statement, but you have to know what it means. Number 30, thought provoking, write a function, you can't wrong a function, write a function in which the inputs and or the outputs are not numbers. Identify the independent and dependent variables, then find the domain and range of the function. Write a function in which the inputs and outputs. Oh, I thought they meant like make an equation. I'm like, y equals mx plus b or something like that's what. Um, it says and or the outputs. That means I can do one that is and one that's not. We kind of saw that was one that wasn't on the button presses one, right? The outputs weren't numbers. They were food items. So we could do, I could, I could do people, st students and their birth months. I can do both, right? Independent or inputs. Oh, oh, do I have to actually come up with them? I'm going to describe them first. So I can do inputs are student names and outputs birth month, birth months. Now we know our different birth months, January, February, etc., things like that. Identify, identify the independent and dependent variables and find the domain and range of the function. The birth, the student name depends on the birth month. The birth month, oh, never mind. Okay, you know what? That's kind of a dumb one. Um, let's do something a little more obvious. Let's do, I want to think in school terms, though. Let's do, I don't know why I'm having trouble thinking about this. Let's do grade percentage and grade letter. Uh, because they said identify them later. I, we might have to write them. So grade percentage, grade letter. So grade percentage. I don't want to write them as intervals. I'm just going to write the numbers like 50, 60 or something like that, right? So we'll just, I'm, I'm making believe, okay? This is how the teacher is going to roll. 50%, 60, 70, 80, 90. Is that okay? And then we have, a, B, C, D, F. No E. All right. Fine. Okay. Identify the independent and dependent variables. The grade letter depends on the 
grade percentage. So this is independent and dependent. I'm bad on thought provoking ones. I can't provoke thought. Then find the domain and range of the function. Oh, I just did that here. Domain range. Okay, I hope that works. Again, maybe we do intervals from 0 to 59.9 or 0.4 or something like that is F, etc. Okay, hopefully that's all right. Numbers 31 to 34, determine whether the statement uses the word function in a way that's mathematically correct. Explain your reasoning. The selling price of an item is a function of the cost of making an item. Um, the selling price of an item is a function of the cost of making an item. You could make an item for the same cost here and here, and you could sell them for different amounts. So that doesn't make sense for that one. So part A, oh, this is just one problem. So number 31, no. Two items that cost the same could be sold for different amounts. Okay. Number 32. The sales tax on a purchased item in a given state is a function of the selling price. That does make sense. The percentage is a fixed amount. So if you spend $10 on something, the extra tax would make it, you know, cost this much instead. $10.95 or something like that, right? So yes. Especially they say certain state. It's going to stay the same within that state. I don't know if that's true for like, I live in Northern California. I'm not sure if Southern California has the same tax. I feel like different cities have different things. But what they mean is fixed fixed um, tax rate. So yes, this is fine. The tax rate, the, the sales tax, let's see, each each price would have a specific, would have a unique sales tax amount. I'm not going to get too heavy on the conversation. Number 33, a function pairs each student in your school with a homeroom teacher. So multiple students can have the same homeroom teacher those students would not have different different home right i'm not going to have two different homeroom teachers and i think that's the way they're saying it they're saying a function pairs each student with them yeah so students are the input homeroom teachers the output so i think that's a yes each student has exactly one homeroom teacher they don't have two or three Does each homeroom teacher have exactly one student? No. But that's not the way they mean it. Number 34, a function pairs each chaperone on a school trip with 10 students. Pairs each chaperone with 10 students. See, this is the split way. This is the homeroom teacher with different students kind of thing. This is a no, that's not a function because not each chaperone has exactly one student. Now, if it was the other way around, yes. But no, in this case, in this case, each chaperone, each chaperone has more than one student. I was going to say each chapter one. Okay. Number 35 to 38, tell whether the statement is true or false. If it is false, explain why. That means if it's true, I don't have to explain why. So, number 35, every function is a relation. Yes, true. Now, I mentioned this before. This was like every convertible is a car. Every function is a relation. A function is a specific type of relation, though, so not every relation is a function. Number 36, every, every relation is a function. That is false. False. Now, in this case here, I mean, I've already said so much about it, I almost feel like I don't know how to describe it now. There are relations that can have more than one output for the same input. Therefore, some relations aren't functions. Number 37. When you switch the inputs and outputs of any function, the resulting relation is a function. No, we just, we just did an example on the open-ended. I can literally say false C number... Gosh, we already went this far. False, C number 26. Number 26, we did exactly that. 
Um, literally, can I say that? Because we did it. You can just prove by count example. C number 26 on the open-ended, where we did exactly that. Obviously, the explanation is that, you know, every input can have one output this way, but then you swap them. Now those output, you know, the outputs are now inputs. Those inputs don't have to have one output there. So just depends on what's duplicates, things like that. Number 38, when the domain of a function has an infinite number of values, the range always has an infinite number of values. Uh, -uh. Now this is a case where I'm not going to say C number whatever, but do you remember the one that had, it was this one, number 14? Let's say that number 14, or, or this one right here, because this one seems to oscillate, number 12 might be even better. But on number 14, imagine that this was a flat line. Oh, that's yellow, you can't see that. Imagine that this was a flat line that went across the entirety of this domain. X goes from negative to positive infinity, but this Y value always stays as three. It never changes. Or this one has a clear oscillating pattern. This is called a sine wave of going up and down like that, and it's going to continue that forever. It goes from negative one to positive one, negative one to positive one. It hits zero in between, it hits all those values, but it's not an infinite range. It doesn't go infinitely both directions, whereas domain goes forever. So false because you can have flat lines and sine waves and things like that. So you can disprove by counterexample and that's among them. So false, like a flat line, right? So uh, I don't know how I want to say that though, but the inputs, remember you can have multiple inputs go to the same output multiple inputs can go to the same output go to the same output and that output could repeat in a finite manner while the inputs span infinitely so like i said oscillating wave a flat line something like that Okay, number 39 on mathematical connection says, consider the triangle shown. It says, write a function that represents the perimeter of the triangle. The perimeter is a function that depends on h. So the perimeter equals h plus 10 plus 13. If I simplify that, that's h plus 23. Part B says identify the independent and dependent variables. Well, as I said, perimeter depends on the H value. So independent variable is literally H. Dependent variable is P, your perimeter. Part C says describe the domain and range of the function. Hint the sum. We did this once before. The sum of the lengths of any two sides of a triangle is greater than the length of the remaining side. Now, H can either be the smallest of the smallest sides with 10 or it can be the longest side beyond 10 and 13. So we have two different inequalities to write here. H plus 10 must be greater than 13. And also 10 plus 13 could potentially, or must, must be greater than H in any case. I'm not saying this has to be represent a single H, not at all. But we subtract 10 from both sides here to show that H has to be greater than three. Otherwise you don't make a triangle. H also has to be greater than zero in general. But here it must be greater than three. Any three or less, it's not, big enough to make a triangle. If I add 10 and 13, I get 23. That means H also has to be less than 23. This is an AND case, by the way, that makes this a compound inequality. So my domain is going to be this continuous relation or this continuous set here that says H is between three and 23. Now range is dependent on domain, right? This is where I could substitute three for H. Now remember, H can't be three, but based on H not being able to be three, I can determine what perimeter can't be. And same with H being 23 as well. So for my range, what I'm going to do is do P equals H plus 23, three plus 23. This is the minimum that it can't be, which is 26. And then also 23 plus 23, which is 46. P is not allowed to be 26 or 46, but it can be everything in between based on H being not this small and not this large, right? Hitting its floor, hitting its ceiling. So the range is going to be from 26 to 46 for perimeter. So that's our range, that's our domain. That's our part C. Okay, we have four more questions. Number 40 to 43, find the domain and range of the function. 
first one says y equals absolute value of x. Now I have to be careful because I know a lot about these graphs. I teach a lot about these graphs specifically in IM2 and you're going to learn some things with that as well. The thing that we have to understand is that for this domain, there's no restriction for X. I can substitute any value in the world and I'll always get a Y value out in this case. Unlike the H thing, I, there's no limit. I can go to negative a billion if I want to, or positive a billion or zero or pi or whatever. My domain in this case is all real numbers. Now I have a symbol for this I'll be using in the future that this isn't the perfect version of the symbol itself. You can look it up, type all real numbers into Google Images. You'll get something that looks kind of like this. It's like a capital R, but it's like a double block. R. I don't draw it perfectly, but that's how I do draw it. Just so you know for the future. The range is a little bit different though. Think about this, and we've, see, we've talked about this. You take the absolute value of something, input, the result, output it is always zero or positive. You can never get a Y value that is negative if you're plugging in any value for X. If I plug in negative a billion for X, absolute value of a billion is a billion. If I plug in zero for X, absolute value of zero is zero. There's nothing I can plug in that gets me negative, so the lowest Y can be a zero, and it can only go up from there. Y is greater than or equal to zero. This is true for the absolute value domain and range. Number 41 is a little bit opposite of this. Now, when it comes to domain, again, there's no restriction on this. I can plug in anything for X. I'll still get a value for Y. Whether the Y's are things I like or not, that's it's not a subjective question. Domain is, once again, all real numbers, so I'll give that symbol now in this case. And I'm just going to give a spoiler alert. Heads up, guys. There's no restriction on X for any of these. I can plug in whatever for X. I will get a value for Y, and that's all that matters. The range, this case, is a little bit different, right? Take the absolute value of something that turns positive. You take the opposite of that, it's going to turn negative. Now, the opposite of zero is still zero. There's no change on that, and you can still get zero out from this. But this time, I can't get any positive numbers because now suddenly everything's going to turn negative. We're not taking the absolute value of a negative. Well, you might be, but you're flipping it around after that. This is not inside the absolute value. So range is y is less than or equal to zero in this case, right? We can go all the way up to zero, and it only goes down from there. And again, we're not graphing these right now, but uh, the graph might help you see what they are for sure. We won't graph until I am two, I believe. I don't know for sure. Maybe you do them with tables later. Number 42 says y equals absolute value of x minus six. I want you to think about, the, well, first of all, domains all real numbers, plug in anything for x. Now, based on x, you get certain y values. There's also based on subtracting six, you get certain y values. So I plug in a value for x like two. Absolute value of two is two, minus six is negative four. Suddenly I can get some negative numbers. Can I get any negative number? No. Remember, on this equation, the smallest y value I could ever get was zero. What if I subtracted six from the smallest number I could get? Well, then the smallest number I could get is negative six. If I plug in zero for x, absolute value of zero is zero, minus six is negative six. Can I get a number smaller than negative six for y here? No. If zero is the smallest number I can get inside here, or from the absolute value, Subtracting six from it's the smallest y value I can get. I can still go up to infinity. In absolute value of infinity minus six still sounds like infinity to me, if you know what I mean. The range in this case, it's only six less than this was, but it's still greater than or equal to. Y is greater than or equal to negative six. We can go as low as that and go up from there. I should box these. The last one says y equals four minus the absolute value of x. That one's a little bit, I don't know if the word's tricky, but it is best if we maybe do a rewrite of this as my preference, just because we did number 41. If I rewrite these so that the, abs the absolute value of x, which is negative by the way, is written first, and then I have four is positive plus four after, this can help connect it to 41, just like 42 connected to 40. Because this is the opposite of the absolute value of x, it's going to be like this one, where y has to be less than or equal to something. All negative numbers and zero, but hey, we can add four to those numbers. So now, because the highest value you could get was zero before, what's the highest value you can get to this set now that we can add four to our numbers? Now the biggest number is four, and it only goes down from there, right? Four minus one, I, I mean, this is where this one helps more. Four minus one, four minus seven, four minus zero, four is the largest you can get. But based off this, you take this range that you had before and you add four to it. So the domain is all real numbers, but the range is y is less than or equal to positive four. 
those are visuals without the graphs you won't know how to graph those anyway we just got to make sure we know our absolute values and i think that should be enough and guys that ought to do it for this one this is mr robinson thank you so much for watching on the first set on functions hopefully we now have an idea of what functions mean and are we've seen significantly different representations of them not so much on equations yet but i think we're meant to get into those now that we understand what functions are and what we can do with them so this is the beginning of chapter three we have five more chapter uh, sections to go in this chapter i'm looking forward to it thank you so much guys take care i'll see you in the next one